Welcome to NICU Essentials. Today, we will be discussing neonatal nutrition. This lecture is designed to give a brief general overview of neonatal nutrition in order to help pediatric residents starting in the NICU. In this lecture, we will cover nutritional principles, as well as requirements for energy, fluids, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and electrolytes. The overall goal for neonatal nutrition is to match, as close as possible, intrauterine growth. Fetal growth velocity in the third trimester, for example, is estimated as being 15 to 20 grams per kilo per day. Matching this can be difficult to achieve as postnatal means for delivery of nutrition are not as efficient as the intrauterine environment. However, persistent postnatal growth failure is associated with poor neurocognitive developmental outcomes long term. Next, you need to be aware of the increased energy expenditures in preterm infants. Preterm infants have low energy reserves secondary to limited body fat and glycogen stores, as these typically accrue during the third trimester. This, combined with thin skin, leads to increased insensible losses. Total energy requirements can be estimated to be between 90 to 120 kcals per kilo per day in preterm infants. However, in sick preterm infants or those with growth restriction, energy requirements may be significantly higher. Lastly, we want to provide nutritional support safely. The goal is to match intrauterine growth as close as possible without causing harm. This often includes starting low volume enteral feeds with slow incremental advances in order to avoid necrotizing enterocolitis, close fluid management to avoid hyperglycemia, and not placing calcium in peripheral IVs to avoid calcium burns. Let's start with energy requirements. Based on what we know about the increased energy expenditures of preterm infants, we can estimate the required energy requirements for optimal growth. Preterm infants should aim for 110 to 130 kcals per kilo per day from all energy sources, while term infants with more energy stores will require fewer calories, roughly 100 to 120 kcals per kilo per day. The way we will achieve this will be through three primary energy sources. Protein, carbohydrates, such as glucose when using TPN, and fat. Protein provides 4 kcals per gram, while glucose provides 3.4 kcals per gram. Fat provides 9 kcals per gram. The majority of an infant's total body water at birth is primarily located in the extracellular space. This water is lost through increased insensible losses in preterm infants for a variety of factors, including environmental, physiologic, and therapeutic factors. Due to premature skin, which has not fully keratinized, a significant amount of losses are through the skin. However, this relationship is inversely correlated with gestational age. As the skin becomes more keratinized over time, transepidermal insensible water losses decrease. Total fluids is a measurement of how much fluid is delivered to the infant per day. There are differences between giving those fluids enterally versus paraenterally. Enterally derived fluids are typically higher as there is not full absorption of the fluids from the GI tract. For preterm infants, parenteral nutrition generally starts around 80 cc per kilo per day. For extremely low birth weight, such as less than 1,000 grams, you can start fluids higher 
at 100 cc per kilo per day. Advance fluids daily by 20 cc per kilo until a goal of 120 cc per kilo per day. When starting enteral feeds for preterm infants, start with 20 cc per kilo per day of feeds and advance by 20 cc per kilo daily until goal feeds of 150 cc per kilo per day are met. It is important to recognize that in some patients, such as cardiac or GI patients, fluid requirements may be slightly different. In preterm infants, protein losses start immediately after delivery. If placed only on glucose-containing fluids, preterm infants will lose around 1% of protein stores daily in order to keep up with metabolic needs. This is highlighted in the graph shown by the red line. If given one gram per kilo per day of protein, seen in the blue dotted line, the patient's protein stores remain stable. If given three grams per kilo per day, seen in the solid blue line, body protein stores gradually improve. However, note that despite giving three grams per kilo per day to this hypothetical infant, it still does not match what is achieved in utero, as seen in the yellow line. Preterm infants can be initiated on starter TPN, Clinimix, which, when run at the appropriate rate, provides two grams per kilo per day of protein. For very low or low birth weight babies, such as those less than 1,500 grams, goal protein should be between 3.5 to 4 grams per kilo per day. For late preterm infants, 3 to 3.5 grams per kilo per day should be sufficient. In term infants, starting Clinimix provides 2 grams per kilo per day. Protein can then be advanced to a goal of 3 grams per kilo per day. When it comes to amino acid choices, there are three options in our NICU. First is Clinimix, which is a pre-made starter TPN. It comes in D10, which cannot be altered. If run at a total fluids rate of 45 cc per kilo per day, it will provide 2 grams per kilo per day of protein. The remainder of the IV fluids will be made up by plain D10. When ordering official TPN, typically on the second day of life, you can choose from Pramisol and Travisol. These amino acid formulations are titrated to achieve the necessary protein goal of the patient. Pramisol is often used in low birth weight infants. It contains cysteine, which will acidify the pH of the solution, allowing for increased solubility of vital nutrients such as calcium and phosphorus. This can be especially useful in small infants where the volume of TPN may be limited by patient size, thus limiting the amount of calcium and phosphorus given if another formulation was used. Lastly, there is Travisol, which is the standard amino acid formulation used on our unit. Breast milk provides adequate protein for term infants. However, for preterm infants on enteral feeds of human or donor milk, protein levels do not quite meet the requirements for adequate growth. The criteria for liquid protein use are infants less than 2,500 grams and those with low birth weight and growth restriction. 0.75 milliliters applied to every feed leads to one gram total of protein per day. You can double that dose to increase protein supplementation as needed. In infants, carbohydrates make up the bulk nutritional calories. In human milk, lactose is the main carbohydrate. However, in formula, glucose polymers predominate. This is done because of the way these carbohydrates are metabolized. In preterm infants, lactase, the enzyme necessary to process lactose, activity is low, although it eventually reaches normal levels. 
glucose polymers in formula are digested by alpha-glucosidases, which have higher activity levels than lactase in preterm infants. When it comes to parenteral nutrition, glucose requirements are expressed in the milligrams of glucose delivered per kilogram per minute. The equation is the dextrose percentage times the hourly IV rate divided by six times the weight in kilograms. The initial GIR goal is between five to six milligrams per kilogram per minute. You can then titrate the GIR by one to two milligrams daily until you achieve a goal GIR of 11 to 12 in preterm infants or 12 to 14 in term infants. Lipids are dense energy sources that make up a significant portion of an infant's caloric intake. Essential fatty acids, linoleic acid and linolenic acid, cannot be endogenously synthesized in humans, and thus it is necessary to provide these through maternal diet, human milk, formula supplementation, or parenteral lipid administration. It is important to start lipids soon after birth as biochemical evidence of an essential fatty acid deficiency can develop within 72 hours after birth if no lipids are given. This can be avoided by providing at least 0.5 to 1 grams per kilo per day of lipid supplementation. In human milk, total fat content varies with maternal diet and postnatal age. At only three days of age, postnatal human milk contains only two grams per deciliter. But once the milk matures, it can increase to four to five grams per deciliter. Parenterally administered lipids are the mainstay of premature lipid administration. Start all infants on one gram per kilo per day. Advance by one gram per kilo per day until a goal of 3 grams per kilo per day is achieved. Once at goal, it is prudent to check a triglyceride level to assess tolerance to lipid supplementation. If it is greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter, consider decreasing lipid amount per day or discuss with your fellow or attending about changing to a different lipid formulation. In our NICU, there are three choices available for parenteral lipids. First is intralipids. It was one of the original lipid formulations synthesized and it is made from soybean oil. In our NICU, it remains the standard first choice for lipids. Next is SMOF, which is a relatively new formulation that has come to be used in many NICUs. It is a combination of different fatty oils in different concentrations which through decreased activation of inflammatory mediators, leads to decreased rates of TPN cholestasis and liver failure that is seen in regular lipid formulations. The indications are low birth weight, less than one kilogram, a GI disorder, greater than two weeks on TPN, or anticipated need for prolonged TPN. SMOF lipid is also indicated if a patient demonstrates intolerance to lipids, which our NICU has defined as being unable to obtain a triglyceride level less than 250 milligrams per deciliter. Lastly is Omegaven, which is 100% fish oil. This type of lipid is used to treat TPN-related cholestasis and is currently only available for research purposes. We will only briefly mention electrolyte requirements as a thorough discussion of electrolytes and trace element needs for NICU patients is planned for a future lecture series. But this chart provides the basic electrolyte requirements when ordering TPN. Of note, all of these electrolytes are provided for in human milk and formula. Trophic feeds are hypocaloric, low volume feeds that are done to prime the gut or in other words, to help promote intestinal maturation in preterm infants. As they do not contain sufficient calories or volume, they are generally not included in fluid calculations in the NICU, 
until they exceed 20 cc per kilo per day. It is reasonable to continue trophic feeds for one to three days to monitor for feeding intolerance before advancing. When advancing, increase feeds by 20 cc per kilo per day until goal volume is achieved. Consider starting liquid protein and or discontinuing lipids when feeds reach a total fluid between 80 to 100 cc per kilo per day. When considering what to choose when starting feeds, our NICU operates under breast is best. Maternal breast milk is the optimal source of nutrition when available, but may require supplementation to meet the nutritional needs of preterm infants. Maternal breast milk has several advantages. Its whey protein dominant ratio allows for easier digestion than formula's casein protein dominant formulations. It also contains maternal enzymes that aid digestion. It contains maternal antibodies, lymphocytes, prebiotics, and probiotics, which provide vital immunologic protection prior to vaccination, as well as reducing the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. Lastly, it is a cost-efficient means of nutrition. Some disadvantages include a lower protein content in preterm milk than term milk, resulting in poor postnatal growth if not supplemented by additional protein sources. This is indicated in the graph demonstrating the drastic decrease in protein in preterm milk plotted over weeks of postnatal lactation. The red arrow represents where most manufacturers of human milk fortifier estimate their protein concentration. Preterm milk may also have lower vitamin requirements necessary for catch-up growth. Lastly, maternal stress from worry over a NICU admission may also lead to decreased milk production. Donor breast milk has many of the same advantages of maternal breast milk. However, these are slightly attenuated by a pasteurization process, which destroys or decreases the concentration of some enzymes, immunoglobulins, and lipoproteins. This decreased nutrition can lead to poor postnatal growth, which needs to be carefully monitored while on donor breast milk. Lastly, cost is a significant limiting factor as it is expensive to obtain screened and pasteurized donor milk. The criteria for use of donor milk includes low birth weight or a diagnosis, either fetal or maternal, which precludes the use of maternal breast milk. You should consider weaning donor milk between 32 to 34 weeks corrected gestational age and transition to either maternal milk as production improves or preterm or transitional formulas. This is a helpful chart that breaks down the many options for nutritional support in the NICU. Lastly, this protocol developed by our NICU helps providers with advancing feeds on very low birth weight preterm infants. Of note, it is a very gradual protocol. You may find other protocols that advance faster. However, we have found that this schedule leads to a very low incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis in our unit. If you would like a paper copy, please ask your fellow or attending for a copy. And this concludes another NICU Essentials lecture series. Thank you for watching.